afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. I hope you all had a nice, nice long weekend. Um, and I saw that you all submitted the first assignment. Great. Uh, I'm in the progress of grading them. Uh, and I plan to post solutions when I'm done with uh, grading and then I'll probably go uh, through, through, through the solution um, in the class. But more or less, you were all kind of uh, doing, um, from what I could see, um, doing well in terms of condensing what was in the notebook and then training that to CHPC. You have, some of you have encountered prototypical um, errors when we train models on GPUs, such as CUDA memory issues. Uh, these are all standard things like you wanna queue your job, but there is now suddenly 100 jobs in a queue, but you have a deadline, be it for a homework or you know for a conference deadline, or uh, maybe if you're an engineer somewhere, your you know, boss wants something. These are all very realistic and very common situations. So this is kind of um, what I wanted to also achieve with you training these things on CHPC to get this feeling of, okay, I need to train the model, but if I have 10 days, you know, all the things that could happen in those 10 days, basically, until you actually have a model trained uh, and uh, evaluated. So when you start working on your projects, have that in mind as well, that you want to train some model and you want to produce some explanations for it. And if you have four weeks, which, what you will have only four weeks for your project, you can't be leaving training the model in the, in the very last moment because that simply won't do. So I hope that was uh, educational. And uh, I released the second homework today, and it is due next Thursday at uh, midnight, which is going to be our standard time for uh, assignments. So in this assignment, you will play around with uh, the idea of prompting, and you will not be training any models. You will just do the inference um, in a way that uh, we have described in the last lecture. Um, you're going to do this uh, in the context of a data set derived from the New Yorker caption uh, context. If you don't know what New Yorker is, it is a magazine. And in this magazine, you have these very cute uh, cartoons. And these cartoons are all about human kind of quirkiness and how kind of weird we are as people. And to understand the humor behind it, you kind of need to understand a little bit, something a little bit about humans. So, uh, when we when we proposed this data set, it was the the intent behind it was to see can uh, these large language models we have today understand uh, this kind of uh, you know human quirkiness in these kinds of uh, contexts. So what we proposed in this data set is uh, to explain to generate an explanation for a New Yorker cartoon. So here, for example, we have uh, this, uh, this cartoon. They usually come with the caption below. Caption in, in, in this context is not a literal description of this cartoon, but rather like a joke. And here the caption is, then maybe you should just tell me what you want for your birthday instead of saying you don't care. And we want to generate the explanation for why this is funny. And we are in, when we created this data set, some annotator written uh, this explanation. And the goal is that, the model generates uh, something in this spirit. So what you're going to do in this homework is to prompt two types of models to do something like this, to generate these kinds of explanations. Uh, the challenge, the new challenge for you is that now we have images involved, right? Uh, a little bit scary, both the images and, and the caption or the joke, like uh, this one here. And, you know, luckily for us, uh, the things are kind of, progressing really fast in, in this, uh, you know, large language modeling world. So about two weeks ago, there was this model that has been released. And it is an open source version of another model called Flamingo that was released in DeepMind last year. Excuse me, I said release. It was introduced in a paper, but not literally released in the terms we can use it. So people uh, in this team have tried to replicate it and they have kind of uh, done so. So in the homework, you are going to prompt this model. You will give it an image. An image will be um, an object, uh, an image object from the library called Pillow. Um, I provided you code kind of to see what you need to do. Uh, you won't deal with this uh, too much. Uh, you will just give it this pill object uh, to, to this model. 
Um, the gist of your homework is to then um, I provided you code. I provided you here the the Python file such that you don't need to copy it from the uh, from the uh, Google Doc directly. But the I'm opening it here in my editor. Here you'll see. We'll kill this here. Here I added you these errors where you need to uh, basically add your prompts for each of the five randomly uh, sampled evaluation examples. And there I want you to instruct the model uh, and also to give two examples of what you are expecting it to do. And the way you're going to go about this, it's written in the document, you're going to see how um, these authors have prompted their model for some other task. And from that, you will think about, okay, how can I do something similar for this task of explanation uh, uh, generation? So that's the kind of the gist of what you need to do for the homework. There is no right answer to this. Uh, I am not looking for some magical prompt. I just want to see that you figure, that you understand that for each evaluation instance, you are given that instruction together with two uh, training examples that are always the same two training examples. Um, so that's about the first model. The second model is Llama that we talked about last time, which is just pure language model. It doesn't deal with any images. And there we are going to use the property of this data set, uh, which has descriptions, human written descriptions of each one of these cartoons. So here, someone, some person has written the whole description of this image. And now that we have this description and this rich annotations of this image, we are circumventing the problem of needing to do computer vision. So we don't require from the model to understand everything that's going on. And this is much simpler, simpler setup because now there is no computer vision. So you're going to use the Llama, uh, Llama tool. You're going to give it these descriptions caption and try to generate uh, the joke. And again, it's on you to find the appropriate prompt to get some, uh, some of these explanations. And then you will need to kind of look at those generated explanation and again, write up your analysis of what you think, how good these models are in explaining these jokes. Um, that's, that's it. Any, any questions about this second homework? Okay, I hope I hope it's going to be fun for you to look at these uh, cartoons, uh, something a little bit different. And yeah, you you can be pretty creative with prompts. So yeah, feel free to go <laughs> uh, go wild and and uh, try whatever you can uh, come up uh, with. Okay, so that's about the uh, assignment two, which is uh, due next Thursday. So have in mind that that, that is coming soon. Um, also, have in mind that you need to uh, request access to Llama 2 model, so do that right away. So don't wait until the last second and then they need a couple of hours to approve your request and then you are in trouble because you don't have access to the model. So do that immediately, um, after the class, ideally. Yeah, and the reason why these weights are not, you know, accessible to anyone while they are doing these checks is because there is this whole ongoing discussion about whether we should be releasing uh, large language models. So there is one group of companies like OpenAI, ironically, and Anthropic that do not release uh, their models weights because their, their argument is that these things in the wrong hands can be dangerous. They can be, for example, used to generate misinformation at a large scale. Um, other group of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, companies, organizations such as Meta and Hugging Face and a lot of academic labs um, think that we should keep open sourcing these things such that we can have uh, more transparency around what they are and to have more appropriate science. Because if you don't know anything about the artifact that we are analyzing, it's hard to make robust claims uh, about it and proper you know, experiments. So it's an ongoing discussion. I don't think there is like, it's not, for me, from my standpoint, it's not like one of these viewpoint is clearly right or wrong. I think this is really difficult question. And there is 
uh, a lot of more nuanced discussion about this, about how we could go and have more graded access where we start with a closed system and then eventually we start to release it maybe to certain groups and so on. So just have, have in mind that, that this discussion is going on and if you're interested, happy to, happy to give you some pointers. Okay, uh, we are also going to start our paper discussions. Uh, we are going to follow this role-playing uh, seminar uh, set up. You, uh, I hope you are first, you know that on the, we have class web page and then on the class web page, we have uh, part for paper discussion. And here is the description of, of this whole thing that we are gonna do here. Uh, basically what is going to happen, we have six of these sessions. In each session, uh, there is paper one and paper two. You all gonna read uh, paper one. And then uh, one of you is going to read also paper two. You are all, of course, welcome to read paper two. Uh, it's it's up to you whether you wanna do that or not. I recommend at least skimming it if you don't have time to read it carefully. Um, and then uh, we will have five presentation roles, meaning five people will present in class from different perspectives. We will have original author role, which means that you are pretending you are a person who wrote the paper and you are presenting the paper at the conference. So this is like a high quality presentation where you are convincing everyone that you have addressed very important research question, you are extremely clear and everyone understands what you have done. So this is the, um, you know, uh, really high quality presentation of the of the work uh, of the paper one. Uh, notice that here we have minutes. Um, let's try to uh, stick to these uh, minutes. Otherwise, there will not be possible for us to go over the, all of the presentations. And also we won't be able to have any discussion. And I will be very aggressive about it. I might give you a little leeway if you are running behind, but if I see you are like in the middle of your presentation and we are already past 10 minutes, I will just uh, stop you. So don't come in that situation. If you're presenting at the conference, you, the AC will come at the stage and tell you to go away. So I will not be... <laughs> like that, but uh, try to try to stick with 10 minutes. So have in mind that if you have 30 slides and you need to present them in 10 minutes, most likely you are not gonna be able to do that. Um, next one is a scientific peer reviewer. Here you're gonna kind of write the official uh, review for the paper and then in class present your points. Uh, archaeologist role is going to find one paper that is cited in the pa paper one present what's uh, kind of what's going on in that paper, and then one paper that has cited paper one and tell us what's going in that paper. Imaginative research role is going to propose an imaginary follow-up project to the paper one. And the last one is a role of pretending to be original author, but of paper two, not paper one. Um, I sign up, uh, I, I, I uh, assigned these roles for all of the six sessions. So if you haven't opened the spreadsheet in this Google uh, Google Drive here, here is the spreadsheet, uh, check it out. On different tabs, there are uh, different names. Be aware where you are. You are assigned to one presentation role only once during the semester, un unless you are an undergraduate student who said that you just wanna uh, participate in the written artifacts. If you are not presenting, you are still need to do something, read the paper one, and then decide whether you are going to play wild card role, which is you can play any role you want. You can be industry practitioner, cranky researcher, moral philosopher, government policymaker, whatever you want, an alien for Mars, whatever perspective you want to take, you take it, make a up to five minute presentation out of it and add it to the corresponding slide deck. If you're interested in a more you know, clear description of different roles, you can go into this uh, original proposal for this kind of seminars and check them out. Uh, otherwise, you will write something, either a summary of your like um, notes during the reading or a blog post, an opinion piece, or you will have kind of take, you will take notes during the uh, discussion. 
that we have in class, and then you submit your notes right after the class. However, you can play this role only once uh, in the semester. And my suggestion is, is that you uh, leave it after you, for the session after you present in person, just to give you, because you might have other assignments and that might, that, that's basically the easiest thing to do in terms of these paper discussions. So it might be um, good to do it then. Okay, um, any questions about this thing? Yeah, please. Is there any no, uh, so if you're presenting uh, paper two, um, you don't need to ground it in paper one. I didn't choose papers that are, they are related thematically. Uh, for example, next one will be about chain of thoughts evaluation. But one paper is about the faithfulness, the other one is about other aspects unrelated to faithfulness, and it will be hard to ground one in another. So you can um, yeah, prepare the presentation completely um, ignoring paper one. Um, that said, if you skimmed paper one and you see some connection, you want to mention it, why not? Right. Okay, so yeah, probably this is going to be chaotic. Um, this is my first time organizing something like this, but uh, the idea behind some, having these roles instead of having just one person presenting uh, is that we are kind of more, all of us are more engaged in the paper rather than just like sitting and uh, listening to what one person uh, has to say. So hopefully we achieve that. And um, you know, if you, if you sum all these minutes, you would see that there is still like half of the class time just for discussion. And let's try to do that. Like after every presentation, let's try to uh, ask good question and just have a good, a good conversation about the papers we are reading. And yeah, these are two papers that we are gonna read. Uh, read paper one carefully, unless you need to read paper two carefully and paper two you can skip. Okay, so that's all about the organizational stuff I wanted to mention. Um, any any questions from your side? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I, I just rem put this slide because um, I knew I was gonna talk about the uh, assignments, but yeah, these are basically two models you are going to prompt in the in the homework. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit more about prompting and then um, in, in the context of generating explanations, prompting to generate explanations. And then we'll talk a little bit about fine tuning to generate explanations. And finally, how we can evaluate these explanations that we have generated. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the APIs for engaging with closed source models. So models for which we do not have access to weights, such as LAMA2 or the, uh, the other one you are gonna evaluate in the uh, assignment. I keep avoiding saying the name because I have no idea how to actually, uh, actually say it. Um, so it's a really cumbersome one. Um, so I will keep saying like the other, the other one referring to that. Um, I don't know how, how you would say it. Uh, anyway, and the rest. So if you if you are going to um, interact with, let's say, OpenAI's models, you have two options. You can uh, go to their playground. So if you Google OpenAI playground and you you know register, you will have uh, you will see something like this. And um, I want to emphasize that this is a paid service. So um, if you are using this and you put your credit card, you will be charged for um, getting these generations. Um, a thing I want to uh, I want to highlight is this uh, this uh, model name here. But before I do that, uh, I'm I'm going to point out that another way you can use OpenAI's uh, models is through their API. So you pip install OpenAI uh, package, you import it, and then you set some variables and you uh, uh, prompt the model to generate something, giving your prompt by just 
uh, using this function openai.completion.create. So if you if you need to get a few generations for a few instances, you use Playground because that's easy and you know the interface is nice. But let's say you want to evaluate the data set of 10,000 evaluation instances, you're not going to put every single one of them in the Playground, that will take forever. So you're going to use something uh, like this, right? Um, here, of course, this is how it's connected to your account and that's how you're going to get charged for uh, getting generations for uh, thousands of instances. So be careful with that, although you can always set the quotas so you don't necessarily spend too much money. Um, I think I want to mention is, is this. So if you go to, uh, to the to their playground, you will see that they're not calling their models GPT-3, 4, or whatever. Uh, you will see names such as text Da Vinci or 002 or 003 and so on. So um, what I want you to remember is when you're reading a paper and then you read GPT-3, ask yourself which GPT-3, because it can be the original GPT-3 proposed in uh, Brown et al. 2020, which is, you know, vanilla language modeling, where we just have language modeling objective, but it can be like, for example, text Da Vinci 002, uh, it can be a, a version of their instruct GPT model, but not their original instruct GPT model for which we have an actual paper and some documentation of what that model is. This, this one, we don't have no idea what this one is. And, you know, after some pressing on social media, OpenAI has said, okay, we will give you some, some details such as that, uh, okay, uh, this one, it was fine-tuned on prompts submitted to earlier versions of InstructGPT. We took those prompts, we annotated them, and then we further fine-tuned InstructGPT to get this uh, text Da Vinci 002. Um, more tokens can fit in this context. I will, we will not tell you which uh, model size this is and stuff like that. So um, depending, you know, uh, for a while, researchers didn't understand that they are actually using something that's not vanilla GPT-3. So they just wrote in their paper, we evaluated GPT-3. Uh, but in reality, they have evaluated in uh, and struck GPT and not even the original one, but like even the fancier version of it. So just have that in mind whenever you are reading any paper or um, any, especially any kind of, you know, news article that says GPT-3 and then it can mean something widely different. So be cautious about, about that. So, yeah, and I think this is a good point to kind of emphasize why why in context learning with models that are not open sourced is, is causing many issues. First of all, you need to pay for them. Um, there is poor documentation. For example, we know that Text Da Vinci 2 has been further trained by taking prompts people put in the playground and some people annotating those, but then NLP researchers put all the test evaluation data into the playground. So is now test data, uh, annotated and then a part of the training data for few further iterations of these models, it's com completely conceivable. Uh, so without knowing what exactly is our data, we can't really tell are we protecting our, you know, train test split, which is kind of like a holy grail of machine learning one-on-one. So that's a little bit finicky. Uh, and of course, if we do end up saying, oh yeah, new version of GPT is great at this, us because look how performance has boosted, but it boosted only because you have trained on the test set. That's just a poor experimental practice. Um, if we don't have access to model weights, we don't can't inspect them um, and, and so on. So there are a lot of bad things that happens when you try to do science with these things. And this is why, you know, it's nice that now we are having these open source alternatives that uh, enable us to, to do something more robust. Um, and I also want to mention that I did mention the chain of thought prompting as like one advanced advanced prompting. We have learned that it's not that advanced. Uh, but I also want to highlight that 
there is a whole uh, line of work in NLP to you know, suggest uh, different ways of prompting. So I just sprinkled some of them here uh, to kind of point you to some directions. You can have, for example, here, ask me anything prompt decomposes your uh, your prompt in a series of uh, sub questions and answers, and then uh, answers those to kind of marginalize the final answer over the all of these sub questions and some answers. So just have in mind that there are many proposals about how to how to prompt models to uh, induce their reasoning abilities to the to the maximum potential. Um, and all of these can in a way also be seen as some kinds of explanations. If you have a question, but then you decompose it into series of sub questions or sub answers, and then you can see which sub questions or sub answer sub sub questions the model can answer well. That also tell you something about the behavior of the model. So if you are an expert trying to understand your model, this kind of additional information, and I'm loosely using additional information uh, with you know I'm kind of combining the. I'm I'm using the additional information interchangeably with explanation. Then this additional information in a form of sub questions can be useful to domain uh, to to experts uh, that are developing these models. Okay, so these are just some extra things I wanted to mention about prompting. But um, maybe let's take a step back and kind of uh, revisit what are we talking about in uh, on a on a more high level. So. We are answering the question, given some uh, some answer, let's say to a question, we are uh, wondering why the model gave uh, this answer. And our first local explanation, explanation that explain why the model answered a um, particular question um, uh, like, it, uh, that, like it did um, with, excuse me, uh, this sentence was, uh, just uh, super complicated. Let me start over. So we are answering why the model answered something in a certain way. And our first way of explaining is to generate uh, an explanation in plain language. And we call those explanations free text explanations. In the process, we learn that there is also another term, uh, chain, of, uh, chain of thoughts. And uh, we started with uh, one way of producing those pretext explanations, namely to just ask the model to explain its reasoning. Uh, we, we prompted the model to think step by step, and by us prompting it to uh, think step by step, it gave us reasoning than the answer. And the, the generated reasoning is the explanation for why uh, the model answered the question with that answer. Um, before we were having models that were able to just be prompted and without any additional training uh, generate explanations, we would actually fine tune them, meaning train them and change them parameters to be able to do this. So let's say we have, this is a common sense QA instance. It's a question answering task where you need to kind of, you probe models reasoning about, uh, any kind of common sense knowledge. So here the question is, where is the frisbee in play likely to be? And you give it a few choices. The most likely choice is that it's going to be in air. And uh, you might want to see whether it can explain why air is the most likely option here. And if it's a good model, it will generate something along the lines. A frisbee is a concave plastic disc designed for skimming through the air as an outdoor game. So while in place, it's most likely to be in the air. So we have uh, a data set called ECQA that has these question answer pairs together with human written free text explanations. And before the prompting was uh, you know, really powerful as, a, as it is today, what we would do is train a model to generate label and free text explanation. For that, we first needed some human written explanations and unlike with in-context learning, where we, you know, need only a few of those, with before we had to have tens of thousands of instances to train a model. So you have a have a data set. So you uh, saw the original authors recruited people. People wrote uh, explanations for 
um, those instances, and that's our supervision. And then we are going to just fine tune our pre-trained transformer based generation model. These days you would use Plan T5 or Llama 2, anything that's the kind of the, the state of the art right now. And you would train it to generate a sequence, uh, answer or label because then explanation. Uh, in the previous instance, that would be air because a frisbee is a concave plastic disc and so on. Um, and again, you don't need to use this exact format. You might decide whether that something better would work with your model given the data it has been uh, pre-trained uh, on, on. You might wonder like, okay, uh, we have already said that Flanty 5 and Llama 2 might be prompted uh, to give me some reasoning without any extra training. Why would I train the model then? That's annoying. I don't like to deal with, you know, back propagation and CHPC. Uh, it, it is true that for some tasks you might prompt it, but then for other tasks, and this stands for any kind of fine tuning these days, uh, although these things are sold as general purpose, and indeed they can do many things, uh, they still for specific tasks can be way worse if we don't fine tune them further. So if you are interested in a specific a task in a clinical domain, you are probably still way better off by fine tuning a model to not only uh, predict uh, the label, but also to generate explanations. So it's not like fine tuning is now obsolete just because we can do in context learning for certain things and do prompting for certain things. So uh, there is a good chance that you will have a task that's kind of unusual, that's not prototypical kind of text or image that you see on the web. Um, and you can imagine that clinical notes or x-rays, you don't have abundance of those uh, on Reddit, let's say. Uh, then then fine tuning, even Flanty 5 or Llama 2 uh, is, a, is a good idea. Okay, um, this approach where you, here we turn, we have two tasks basically, predict the label and generate explanation. But we turn everything into a single sequence and instead of doing, you know, um, having, you know, adding extra layers to do labeling and extra layers to do generation, we combine everything in one sequence and now we do everything in one go. Uh, and this approach, when you kind of uh, produce your input uh, as, a, as a sequence and your output is also a sequence, is called sequence to sequence approach. And this has been, you know, proposed in 2014. Right now, I think with everything being framed as a generative AI, it kind of seems like, duh, of course you would approach it like that but it's, um, it hasn't been like that before. Uh, we didn't turn everything into, into sequences. Uh, larger your model, better chance that your uh, generation will be better. There is uh, evidence that larger models are generating uh, better text. And uh, these days, for example, with, for example, let's say take Llama 2. Uh, Llama 2 comes, the smallest size is 7 billion, the one you will use in your homework. So, you know, it's kind of you're even restricted in a sense that you cannot use smaller models. You don't even have an option because you're not given Llama 2 of 300 million parameters. The smallest one is 7 billion, which is still pretty large. So this comment might be a little bit uh, outdated. But uh, Flanty 5 comes in uh, various sizes, uh, up to 11 billion. So if you are using Flanty 5 and you have used large versions, which is of size 770 million, and you achieve some results and you're like, how could I boost them? Well, just increase the size. You will probably, your generation will likely, likely be better. Um, models that are instruction fine-tuned with chain of thought, such as Flint 25, are likely to be better in, uh, choices for, uh, as a backbone model, you're going to fine-tune because they have been already primed to uh, generate reasoning. It might be some kind of region reasoning that is completely relevant for your task you're interested in, such as, you know, a freeze being plays likely to be in air. Like it's not relevant for explaining some medical, uh, you know, situations most likely. But the fact that the model was primed to do something like this might be helpful. So if you're like thinking, ah, which model I will fine tune for my clinical uh, task, 
Flanty 5 or the light models are good choices because they have been fine instruction fine tuning chain of thoughts. And models that are pre-trained only with mask language modeling objective are out of picture here. They are not good for generations, so don't even think about them. Think about encoder, decoder, or, or decoder only models. Okay, I will just quickly go into uh, the few details of, uh, of fine tuning, then I'll stop and see whether you have any questions. So, you know, uh, both with prompting and with fine tuning, the situation is similar. We have our sequence and we are generating sequence. Sequence here is a question, semicolon, where is frisbee play likely to be cho choice, semicolon, outside, choice, semicolon, park, and so on. And then you need to generate uh, the answer, error, because an explanation. With prompting, remember, we give a little bit more instructions, such as you are a helpful assistant and you will help me with blah, 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 blah. And you give it like two, two instances and so on. So the, the, the input here is a little bit richer if you're just doing the inference. But general picture is the same. You have some sequence that you're giving in the input and some sequence that you are uh, outputting. In the outputting stage, or decoding stage, we are decoding one token at a time, right? And remember, uh, we are doing so by getting some kind of hidden representation at the uh, last layer of the decoder stack for the current token in our uh, decoding um, you know, stage. If we are starting, we have beginning of sequence token, and then we are going to multiply with the output metrics, get the vector of the size of our vocabulary, and then uh, use some sampling procedure to choose which one uh, we are going to actually output. I want to emphasize something though. Um, I, I will come back to this equation, but what we are doing during training and during inference is slightly different. During training, we are in, uh, doing something called teacher forcing, where here, you might uh, find that the first word, first token is most likely, uh, but actually in your ground truth text, you know that the second word is the most uh, most likely. And then instead of giving what the model thing should be predicted, you are forcing what you know is, uh, is in the goal data. And as in the next decoding step, you are giving the representation of the token that you have seen in the goal data instead of what the model would decode. And th this is just a way to enforce supervision. Like, okay, model, think something, but you're like, no, you should be thinking this, basically. Uh, it's also good for training because you don't need to decode words to know what the next one is. So you can produce your decoder, decoder sequence and just pass it into the coder layers and get uh, all the logics, all the, uh, uh, the probabilities that you're going to multiply for the loss. So in terms of um, training is also way faster because you don't need to do things sequentially. Um, you, if you always do teacher forcing, it can cause some kind of generalization issues. So sometimes people will uh, this sample which batches they are going to do teacher forcing for and for which they will uh, they will not. Um, okay, so that's that. And the final loss um, we have talked about this before when we talked about language modeling, uh, but your final loss is going to be a product of all the uh, logits after the softmax for the the max of the of the logics at each uh, at each step, and uh, when you when you uh, make a product of them due to the chain rule, you will get the probability of your entire sequence, and that's your final loss that you can use for back propagation. Okay. I want to talk about what we do at the inference time, but I want to stop here. There, there were a lot of details thrown at you, so. Um, I'm sure you are confused somewhere. So I would like to know <laughs> where, where, uh, whether, you know, anything is, is unclear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm really understanding the future portion, mm -hmm. um, exactly. Mm -hmm. So is it just the first token you're forcing or 
No, it's at every decoding step. Uh, yeah, maybe let me illustrate that. Um, okay, so, so uh, when we are decoding text, we start with uh, one token, which is going to beginning of the sequence token, right? And then we put it into our decoder stack. And then um, we do this process here. We do the product, we get the logit and, and so on. And eventually we have a vector of the size of the vocabulary, right? Oh, sorry. I can also turn this on. Okay, um, so let's say that here is our max. So the model thinks we should output the first token in the vocabulary as the next word. Um, however, if we would use that, um, it would go in our next step here. Here, and let's say that word was the. So we would put the, into into the decoder decoder layers and repeat this process. However, with teacher forcing, we are not going to uh, use what the model thinks is the um, is the next token. We are going to look at our gold data or our text that we are trying to produce. And let's say the first word was A. And we are going to put A into the uh, decoder layers. We are kind of forcing it to, to, uh, to consider the next token that we deem should be the next token, to kind of train it what the next token uh, should be. Um, and then you will, repeat this process, but for every every decoding step, you are going to then use uh, whatever is in your, you know, um, sentence that you are trying to produce. Um, the, the, the thing that I tried to kind of say, I don't think it came across, is that um, when, when you do not do teacher forcing, which uh, you are, you must do when you are at the inference time because at the inference time, you do not know what word comes next, right? Um, then, then you are forced to, forced to do this. And then you need to actually decode the word to be able to put it into the decoder layers, right? But if you, if you are going to do teacher forcing, you always know what you are going to put into the decoder layer. So you don't need to actually decode the word and then put it in the decoder layer. You can take your sequence and put them all into the decoder layers together, which is way simpler because basically think about it as avoiding a for loop. Yeah. So it's faster as well. And I think that's also a huge appeal of teacher forcing. So then are you still storing all the like incorrect decoding that are generated and then using that to the loss to come to use? Yeah. So here, um here, this uh probability of uh W1, that's the uh this value here, that's probability of V1. Yeah, and here we would have probability of uh word two given word one. And so on, and you would you would uh, multiply them, get one score. That score is your loss that you use for calculating the gradient, and then you backpropagate. Okay, and so actually, uh, in the homework assignment, I think now I I close my Visual Studio Code. Uh, let me <clears throat> okay so when i the 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 type of a model you want to use for any kind of um text generation stuff in huggy face is a uh, has this abstraction auto model for causal lm so 
Um, if you want to use Flenty5 or Llama or whatnot, uh, they are all for, for generation of text constrained on uh, other kinds of text. Um, you're going to use this auto model for causal LM. For some reason, I couldn't make it work for the uh, Llama 2. I was running into some issues and it seems like there is still uh, lots of issues with the, the uh, Llama 2 model because it's pretty new. If you're using it with Hugging Face, but if you use Hugging Face's pipeline, you will, it, it's fine. So uh, I left this here just because I want you to know that in your first assignment, you, you have used uh, encoder only transformer, you have used that auto model for classification or something like that. And that's what you are gonna use uh, if you are use, ever using encoder models, most likely. With the, um, with the you know, generative AI or uh, any kind of um, model you are using in a way that you give a sequence and you're producing a sequence, although you are doing actually classification, you are using this auto model for causal uh, LM. Causal stands for, it's actually a term no one likes in NLP, but it stands for the fact that you are giving some text initially uh, when you are doing, let's say, prompting, and then you are constraining your generation on those uh, initial, uh, initial tokens. So the generation is causal with respect to those tokens you have given in the context. Okay. So yeah, I guess for me, it's important that you understand that you, if you want to generate free text explanations or you know chain of thoughts like uh, information, then you do not need to just prompt the model. You can fine tune them if you have data to, to fine tune and you just use hugging face and you use uh, this auto model for causal uh, LM. Um, at the inference time, you do have options. So um, here, I was um, I was always saying that uh, I kind of I hinted that we are um, decoding a token that was uh, most likely in this logic vector, and this is called greedy decoding or greedy search. You are at every step, you are just choosing the most likely uh, most likely uh, token, and. That's an option, but it is um, it is suboptimal. Uh, so we are going to go over some other options for uh, decoding that are pretty standard, and and uh, you will see them, especially in your code. You will see some hyperparameters like top k and top p and uh, temperature. So the problem with with uh, greedy search is that you can end up in this like local. Um, kind of locally optimal solutions. Um, remember, your probability of your whole sequence is a product of individual probabilities. And uh, you might have initially a very high probability for some token, but then uh, all, the, all the upcoming tokens probabilities, if you have chosen that token in the second step, are really small. And then the whole sequence probability due to the making a product of all these probabilities is, is not super high. Um, instead, you might have had on the second step uh, a token that had lower probability than some other, but if you have chosen that, all the other ones had very high probability and their product of their probabilities altogether was higher than the one I mentioned before. So you can be tricked by choosing the, the most uh, likely one. The nice thing about greedy decoding is that it is uh, deterministic. So if you are replicating someone's uh, results and they use greedy decoding and you set the same seeds and everything, you can get exactly the same generations out. Uh, which is good, if, especially if you are doing classification tasks, but in a generative setup. So greedy search, if you are doing classification, but you are doing everything in a sequence to sequence approach, I think it's a really solid, solid choice. Um, if you are doing actual text generation though, you will most likely use uh, some other approaches. Um, one super, super, super uh, famous one is, uh, is beam search, where instead of you know um, remembering only what was the 
uh, what was the um, the most likely token, you might remember what were the most likely two tokens. And then again, two and two, and you always kind of remember two at each step. So eventually you will have, uh, instead of generating one sequence, you will generate multiple of them and you can rank them with respect to their joint probability, which is the probability of their individual ones. So here is an illustration if you had uh, two, uh, two beams where you would uh, remember uh, the dog, but also the uh, the nice. And then uh, you would have uh, uh, multiple sequences you could choose from. Um, in the in hugging phase, maybe I should mention that for greedy search as well. Uh, it's going to be not relevant for your homework in a sense that I have asked you to tweak any of these parameters, but you will have you will be using this model dot generate. And you can play around with these hyperparameters. I don't, I don't mind. Uh, and you can change you know, these values to generate the different, um, you know, values for the same instance. If you do use greedy decoding, uh, then uh, this is this is an example of how you would call the model uh, generate. So you don't really set any special uh, hyperparameters here. Um, this this is a little bit suspicious, though, honestly, because I think their default param hyperparameters use um, use other kinds of sampling. So, but this is Huggins face written blog, so we should trust them. Um, if you are doing beam search, uh, here is an example. You would uh, say number of beams uh, equals uh, equals five, and then you would uh, consider multiple. Uh, uh, potential tokens instead of just the most uh, likely one. Okay, the one problem with uh, with the uh, beam uh, is that it kind of poses uh, models that have um, engrams, so a sequence of n tokens that uh, that are being repeated are gonna be ranked really highly under this paradigm. So there is another uh, hyperparameter here, no repeat engram of size uh, equals two, which means that you are forbidding the, the, this whole procedure to consider sequences where uh, engram, where two grams, sequences of two tokens are repeated. So uh, for example, you might have New York, you generated it once, and you forbid them, forbid the decoding strategy to propose you a sequence where you would have New York mentioned another time, which is obviously an issue. If you're writing a story about New York, you are likely to mention it a couple of times. So it's also not a great uh, solution to circumvent the problem of repeated uh, engrams. Okay. So, all of these approaches we have talked about so far, they are not including any randomness in the process. And uh, this is, uh, this is um, sometimes an issue. If you, if you want your generations to be like creative in any way, that, then you must include some kind of surprising element to your text. If you are always generating what is likely to be most standard way of phrasing things, that's not type a type of text people prefer. Like we prefer when people when we read text that has a little bit of like a surprise and element to it. So if you are generating anything where you would like this kind of property of text, you are going to use decoding techniques that include some level of uh, randomness. Um, so here there are illustrations of uh, how you know. This might work in you for from the logic uh, vector. You have kind of like a probability. We are using probability loosely because we learn about uncertainty, but something like a probability over the tokens, and we can sample from that uh, distribution. So you you will if if word nice was had associated a probability that's higher than the word car, you will more likely sample that word. Uh, that word nice than word car, but it's not like you will, you don't, you do not have any chance to sample word car. It's small, but you do have some chance to sample it. Okay, so let me see where this is going. Um, the first 
uh, important parameter is called temperature. And we know about temperature because we have used it for calibration, right? So with temperature, you can, uh, you can, um, uh, you can tweak the softmax such that certain uh, probabilities uh, are either more peak or more uniform. So maybe for some reason you want to uh, say that to your decoding strategy that mm, those that are more likely, let's make them even more likely, but you know, um, I, I don't want to use a greedy decoding where I'm always sampling the most likely one, but I want to increase the probability of sampling the most uh, likely one. Or you can decide to make them a little bit more uniform. You're like, oh, I don't want to be always sampling the most likely one. So I'm going to uh, kind of make them a little bit uniform. So you can play around with the temperature parameter. Uh, and easily enough for us, temperature is a parameter in model.generate. So we just play around with it. OK. Then a uh, top case sample. Sampling stands for. Uh, it's the same procedure as the one we have just talked about where you are sampling from this distribution, but instead of um, considering distribution over the entire uh, vocabulary, you are considering the distribution only for the uh, K most likely tokens. So uh, here, um, I, I, did, I don't remember what exactly these illustrations are showing, but the, the hyperparameter we would use to achieve this is a uh, top k. And then if you set top k to 50, you would do something like this. If you set it to zero, then uh, I think you are uh, canceling this behavior. Um, and finally, top p or nuclear sampling, the one that's, um, I would say, most used um, is doing something similar, but uh, it is kind of, it's a very worthy what, what they are doing. They are uh, the in the top P sample chooses from the smallest possible set of words whose cumulative probability exceeds the probability P. So basically the point here is that depending of what kind of word you are going to, you, you are uh, uh, generating next, um, you might work with more or less. You're not always having a fixed, fixed set of, uh, let's say top uh, 50 uh, tokens you are going to uh, sample from, rather than the number uh, will change depending of where you are. So here, um, uh, having set P to let's say 0.92, top P sampling picks the minimum number of words to exceed together P equals 90% of the probability in mass. And in the first example, this includes the nine most likely word, whereas uh, it only has to pick the top three words in the second example to exceed 92%. Intuitively, if you are going to predict the word the, mm, there is probably more words you could start it with, right? And this is what uh, is happening here. You could have used nine words to, to sample. But when you have chosen the, the next word uh, choice is, is smaller. Because now you, there, there is simply less words you can follow the with. So this is what this is doing kind of uh, having more dynamic top uh, K. And this is what you are going to see in in uh, most papers, some choice of, the, uh, of top uh, P. Um, if you had played around with uh, GPT or chat GPT or any of those, you have probably observed this randomness, right? To give it the same instance, and then you observe that it doesn't always give you the same answer. And this is because of these kind of uh, sampling procedures. So if we go uh, back to the screenshot of the playground, here there are parameters temperature and top uh, top P, right? So if you would then uh, 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 place top P all the way to zero and temperature to one, you would get greedy uh, decoding. So these are good things to have in mind, especially if you're trying to reproduce someone's results. If they use a sampling procedure, then you will not get exactly the same outputs. Okay, any questions about different decoding strategies?
as I said, I didn't ask you to do to play around with any of these hyperparameters uh, in the homework, but if you wish to introduce some of them, play around with those, do that. You are not forbidden to, to change them. I think I set everything to greedy decoding, um, but definitely feel uh you know, uh, feel free to to explore the uh, the parameter setup. This task is more on a creative side to kind of explain the joke in the New Yorker cartoons. So uh, you might be better off trying these sampling procedures rather than just doing really the code. Okay, so to kind of recap uh, what uh, I think it's important for you to remember so far, is that we are talking about free text explanations as one choice of explaining why model had predicted something. And it is a kind of the nice thing about free text explanations is that they provide the gist of reasoning in plain English. And because they do so, they are easy to understand by anyone, by us who are developing these models, by you know experts in another domains like uh, uh, doctors or lawyers, to lay people who play around with, uh, you know, chat GPT. Um, they can also be used as behavioral tests by us because you can see what kind of reasoning the model is giving. And then if you see any kind of inconsistencies or um, any kind of contradictions with itself, you can say, okay, this model is kind of funky and maybe doesn't really get, uh, you know, uh, maybe it doesn't predict things for the right reason, it kind of gives you some insights in what your model, how your model is uh, behaving. Um, we have seen that we can prompt them to give us uh, answers uh, and explanations with the latest stage of large language models, such as Flanty 5 and Alama 2 that has been released. Flanty 5 has been released in October last year. Alama 2 has been released in July this year. So um, this hasn't been around for like ages, you know, this ability to kind of prompt to get, get reasonable um, reasoning for variety of things you are interested in is a, is a new thing. And before, ta before we had these abilities, we would usually fine tune models to induce this behavior. And I think that fine tuning is still relevant. I don't think you can get great uh, reasonings from these prompting techniques for any single thing. Um, actually, uh, another thing uh, I, I, that's worthy mentioning is that, um, and I think that's that comes here. Um, so when people have introduced, and I mentioned this when I talked about chain of thought prompting, uh, the focus of these works wasn't to produce um, reasoning that's actually plausible or valid or, you know, there weren't any kind of human evaluations of those reasonings. The point was to increase the performance of the model by making it reason first. So there isn't, uh, I think, a clear study that compares, um, let's say, Lama 2, uh, fine-tuned and just uh, zero-shot prompted, uh, for generation of explanation where people then compare and say which one of these is better. Um, I would be surprised that fine tuning doesn't give us better explanation. So um, yeah, I just don't want you to, uh, to think that now anytime you prompt a large language model to give it reasoning that its reasoning is valid, uh, it can still be very, very wrong. So have that in mind that these things are not generating perfect uh, reasonings and one way to uh, kind of improve their abilities to reason for your specific task is to fine tuning. Okay, but that, that brings us to the question of how to evaluate these things, which I want to talk about. Any questions? Okay, so the next thing we're talking about is about plausibility and faithfulness of these two things, of the, of the free text explanations. Plausibility stands for the person's um, su subjective satisfaction of how reasonable uh, uh, generated explanation is in justifying uh, the uh, predicted label. And another one is faithfulness, which is the 
saying whether the, your free text explanation is an accurate representation of the model's decision process. Remember, the plausibility and faithfulness are not just for the free text explanations. They are uh, used um, to evaluate any kind of local explanations produced by you know, machine learning people. And remember that in the intro, uh, introduction to this course, I said, okay, these are things that the machine learning people cared a lot about, but these two things do not tell us that uh, generated explanation is actually useful. For example, for uh, have, uh, achieving appropriate reliance um, of a doctor in, in a tool that is giving medical diagnosis. So by the end of this course, we will kind of complement plausibility and faithfulness with actual usefulness uh, of these explanations. Uh, but you are going to read these papers and then you're going to see these metrics and it's important that you understand what those metrics are. So let's let's see how we can evaluate like, plausibility. Um, plausibility, okay, uh, because I rearranged, ignore this first uh, sentence. This is, this is not important. Um, measuring the uh, plausibility of free text explanation is, uh, is cannot be done by taking human written explanation. And then um, you might want to measure some kind of overlap metrics uh, in terms of overlap, engram overlap between your generated explanation and the uh, human written explanation. And the reason why you can't do that is because free text format allows much more expressiveness. So agreement might be low. Here are the uh, some explanations from the uh, visual question answering task that I didn't uh, didn't show you, but it's not important what the exact instance is. Uh, let's focus just on these two sentences. First one, it looks like person four is showing the photo to person two, and they will want to be polite. And on the other one, it is common to say something nice about other person's beloved ones. All both of these are valid explanation to that instance that you didn't see. Uh, but the overlap in the words that are shared between the first and the second one is not high. So if you use standard evaluation metrics people use uh, for automatic generation of, uh, in let's say machine translation, such as blue, you will uh, not get a great metric of plausibility of explanation. And this has actually been quantified. So uh, the authors of these papers have measured the correlation between uh, your blue scores that we get for generated free text explanation and uh, so correlation between blue scores and human judgments of whether that free text explanation justifies the instances or not. So for each one of the explanations, you calculate blue scores with respect to the human written explanation. You also ask some person on Amazon m -third, hey, is this a solid explanation or not? They give you yes or no, and then you measure the correlation between blue scores and their binary values. If the score, if the correlation was uh, uh, existed, uh, that would be great. Then we could use blue score and say, uh, okay, we achieved this uh, average blue score and compared to these other people, our is higher and we are all happy because we improved the generation. But we cannot do that. And that's a it's a huge bummer because uh, that means we need to do human evaluation of plausibility of free text explanations. And I, I told you to ignore this first sentence because it uh, deals with other types of uh, explanations we're going to see next week. In those, we don't really need to rely on human uh, evaluation. We can do the overlap. So it's really specific to these free text explanations that we do not have automatic metric uh, yet. Although I'm saying yet because maybe this will uh, this will change. I, I will I will talk about that. So in without an appropriate um, metric, automatic metric, we need to go and do human evaluation, and you must do it. So if you're writing paper and you're proposing free text explanations and you don't have human evaluation, your paper will be rejected. And this stands for almost any kind of uh, uh, text generation. Uh, paper you might want to write. Human evaluation of text is always uh, necessary to complement any kind of automatic metrics you might introduce. Okay, so this is why. <laughs> uh, 
I had the first sentence. Um, okay, so let me let me show you some, a procedure of how you would go about human evaluation here. You will first use your development set and shuffle the instances. You would then um, take the first 300 uh, instances more would be better, of course. Uh, evaluating the entire development set we have would be the best thing uh, to do. But uh, human evaluation costs money, and usually um, uh, we do not have budget to evaluate way more than 300 instances. So this number is kind of something that emerged in uh, NLP research and even you know in computer vision and other areas of machine learning, that's a um, kind of respectable number. It's a few hundred, it's uh, it's kind of enough to, to not be too small. But if you had more money, more would be better. Okay, and then you're going to pick the first 300 that are correctly predicted. So this is a little bit sticky point. Um, it is introduced by this, by this, uh, by this uh, uh, paper, and they say that uh, if the if the, your instance was incorrectly predicted, so you are giving the wrong answer to the question, the explanation must be wrong, which um, not everyone agrees with. Maybe your explanation is still giving a plausible reason for the wrong uh, instance. Uh, but in this paper, they propose this protocol that, okay, we can just deem those are wrong and let's focus on explanation associated with correctly answered uh, instances. Um, you might also balance those 300 with respect to labels. So if you are having a classification task, you might want to represent in those 300 both, uh, both labels. You're then going to ask three annotators, more would be better, three is the, is the minimum, to uh, first select the correct label and answer. And this is done to force your annotators to think about the task instance that the explanation is produced for. Sometimes uh, the incentives for annotators is to do your task as fast as possible, such that in more, uh, in the, in, you know, in one hour, they can solve as many uh, instances on MTurk such that they can be paid, uh, uh, paid more. So sometimes they will skip certain steps that you deem necessary to actually do the annotation properly. So you first ask them, hey, what the what is the answer to this question? Although you're not really interested in that, it's just to prime them for um, evaluation of explanations. And then you show them both the human written explanation and your generated explanation in a random order. And you ask them uh, to assess whether they are uh, justifying the answer above. The reason why gold explanations are showed is to kind to put um, put all of your annotators, you will have many of them, into a similar mindset of what appropriate explanation is. So most likely these human written explanations they are seeing will be something they are like, okay, this is fine, I accept this. But now because they accepted that, um, Similarly, uh, similarly uh, plausible explanation generated by your model will also likely be uh, labeled as yeah, this is fine, because they have seen the same same fine explanation. So they are putting uh, all of them. They might subject subjectively they likely have different expectation of what a plausible explanation is. But by showing them this human written one, they are kind of all being uh, forced to be in a similar mindset. Okay, that's that's that. Um, the you will ask them, does this explanation justify the answer? And instead of giving them just yes or no, it's kind of tricky to have binary labels. Sometimes you're like, ah, oh, it is, but it has this small little annoying thing, and it's not like perfect. So they might feel like putting no, but that's way too strict. So you give them this weak yes and weak no option to kind of um, give them a little bit more, you know, um, flexibility uh, compared to a binary. You can give them also one to five, for example. I, I don't think it really matters. And you're going to turn this uh, this uh, uh, labels into scores one, two thirds, one third, uh, third, and zero respectively. 
And then because we had three annotators for each instance, we can average the scores to get one plausibility score uh, for the instance. And that's the instance plausibility that you have for all of the 300 instances, and then you average them, and that's your uh, plausibility of the explanations generated by your uh, by your model. Does this procedure make sense? Okay, so um, let me just show you a little bit how you would go about doing something like this in uh, M Turk. So, how many of you have? done any kind of human evaluation in MTurk? Can you, can I see hands? One, two, three. Okay. So first thing to know is in uh, MTurk you have two, I don't know how to call them technically, but I'll, let's say two web pages. One is, uh, one page is for a person who is requesting to get people annotate data for them. So for example, I, as an NLP researcher, I need annotators to do human evaluation for me. I am a requester. On the other side, we have people who are annotating data for me, they are workers. I am going to go on a website, requester.mterk.com. They are going to log into the website called worker.mterk.com. However, with uh, annotations, there is a lot of iterations until we are like, okay, this is worth spending money on. So instead of going right to the requester and you know doing this iteration and wasting money, we are going to uh, pretend we are actually doing all of this. And instead of recruiting actual annotators on the worker side, we usually ask our family, friends, uh, colleagues, uh, whoever we know to annotate some data for us on the uh, on these uh, pretend uh, worker and Turk. And these uh, pretend request uh, requester and worker, you will use uh, on the requester sandbox.mturk.com and the worker sandbox .com. They're looking exactly the same. There is nothing different between them. It's just that when you put your submit a batch to be annotated in, in the requester sandbox.mterk.com. The real annotators who uh, do this for a living won't do your task. They, they will just not go there and do it for you they, because they will get zero money and they, you know, they are aware of that. So we are trying to, trying to uh, imagine we are in, in, in one of these pilot stage we are going to go to the uh, requ requester sandbox. Okay, in the requester sandbox, uh, you will have a new project. And then in the new project, oh, it's slow, all right, it works. You will, uh, you have already some uh, templates you could choose from, but most likely you won't use any of those and you will click other here. And you will just ignore what's going on here. Then uh, we will write some project name, eval of explanations. I won't do any of these. You, you wrote write title, description, keywords. Your annotators actually see these things. So they're important, but for the sake of time, I'm just going over them quickly. Uh, then uh, you give them a reward per hit. Um, there is no like magical number here. Some tasks are harder than others. It's good to think about what is the you know minimal hourly wage and then pay your annotators at least that for uh, hour of their work. Uh, you, your one hit is not necessarily going to take an hour. Maybe it's going to take 20 minutes and that's something you figure out in these pilot studies. So if it takes 20 minutes and you know you want to pay them uh, $12 uh, per hour, you kind of uh, will probably pay them $4 for one hit that takes 20 minutes. So you deploy some of these strategies. And right now, because we are doing the pretend task, we, I'm going to put it to zero. Number of assignments per task is number of annotators. You want that to, to see uh, each one of your instances. I said minimally three here. 
Uh, here you're going to give them certain time. Don't give them little time and then they're in the middle of their hit and then they're cut off and they don't get uh, paid for let's say 10 minutes of uh, their work. So, but I don't think you wanna go overboard here uh, either. And then some other things. Very important uh, stuff happens here where you are specifying qualifications for your worker. Very common one is hit approval rate where you want it. I personally would always put it higher than 98, which is really high. And then um, you usually also put uh, the number of hits approved to something like a few few thousand. I think I put thousand or 5,000. And there are other criteria you want here, but these two you definitely should be employing. I will remove them here because I think interfacts interacts with the worker sandbox because I don't have these qualifications. I might not be able to see them. Then we go to design layout. And here we are going to uh, put some templates. So here, usually if you are following work that is well-documented, for example, here I shared with you one of my postdoc code bases where I wrote, uh, where I uh, shared templates uh, for MTurk, you can use uh, use all of that and you drop it here. So this is JavaScript and I personally don't know JavaScript. So I took templates from someone else and tweak them and then someone else takes mine and they tweak them. So there is this whole thing of people just tweaking each other's uh, templates. But that's basically what you do. You drop it here, you preview it. Okay. It's successfully saved. And this is how it looks like on the annotator side. Uh, here they have some examples they can see. And this is the task they are going to be uh, annotating. So this is what's going to happen on the worker side. Here I'm going to click finish. I know I'm a little bit over time, but bear with me just to finish this whole thing. Now you, you have made uh, your project, but you actually need to give the data. You just gave the templates with some variables. So now you actually need to give a spreadsheet with those variables. And here, um, again, I will put something uh, I have written myself, but I do wanna show you, Okay, I feel like I'm rushing just because I'm aware that I'm out of time. So maybe let's stop here and then uh, next Wednesday, I will walk you through it. So this is the first part. On the requester side, you put your uh, your template uh, into, the, into the system. Uh, and this template will have, um, will have, uh, won't have actual, actual data. I just put the actual data, but, um, We'll see what happens on the worker side uh, next time. All right, let's stop here. Thanks for, for a few extra minutes.